And as you're turning to proverb number 24, we want to welcome some visitors with us. We're glad to have George and Patricia here from Erie and Darlene from Wattsburg. Good to have you folks with us today. Thank you for coming. We hope you enjoy your time here with us and come back as often as you can. Proverb number 24, please, we'll begin reading at verse 21. The Bible says, My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. For their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you tonight, today as we come together in this place that you so graciously and generously provided for us to meet in. We thank you, Lord, for your great grace that was sung about this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this time of year called Thanksgiving, when the whole country seems to remember your blessings. But Father, those of us who know Christ as Savior, we know your blessing every day and we're thankful every day of our lives. And today we ask that, my Father, by the grace of God, you might open our hearts and minds, and by your Holy Spirit, you might open the lips of your servant to speak, that, my Lord, you might do that which is pleasing in your sight today. I pray you'd magnify yourself, glorify your Son, edify your people, and save the lost. And we'll certainly give you all the glory and praise for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look about these days, I think we could all agree that things, they are a-changing. In writing to his son, Solomon's desire was to impart wisdom that would guide him through life and make him a great man. And here, Solomon warns of those who are given to change. Well, what does that mean, to be given to change? Does that mean just to change your mind? Does it mean to change from, you know, in a better sense? Well, that phrase given to change it comes from the Hebrew word shana, and it means to transmute. And that word means to change or alter in form, appearance, or nature. It means to disguise, and it means to pervert. So he's saying those who are given... To change are those who would, would alter the nature of something, disguise the truth of something, or pervert the truth of something. Now, it is a characteristic of the Antichrist. Outlined in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. I think the day in which we live, that's a very, very uh, poignant point, wouldn't you say so? That the Antichrist is going to seek to change laws. I think we see that going on right now. The beginning in our own country. It seems that everywhere we look, we see this process going on. We look in the political arena, and we see a disregard for the rule of law, and due process is disguised as patriotism. Trying to deny constitutional rights, and showing a disdain for the Constitution while pretending to uphold it. We go into the judicial arena, and we find the allowing of ideology to pervert justice and jurisprudence, using the courts for social reform, social manipulation, and the promotion of partisanism. We go into the educational arena. We find freedom of speech and the free flow of differing ideas silenced, where violence and intimidation has replaced debate where those who criticize intolerance are themselves the most intolerant. And we have a generation that has arisen that prefers socialism to freedom. We go into the theological arena, where doctrinal truth is supplanted by tradition, religion, humanism, and superstition. Ecumenicalism is promoting a religious utopian unity that will lead to one-worldism. 
We move into the medical arena where established gender norms are replaced with foolish nonsense. Amen. God created two genders, male and female. Amen. It's in the Bible. There are now 58 gender options for Facebook users. Now, you can surgically and medically change your gender nowadays. However, I have only heard of people being changed to one of two genders. Male or female. Are we headed for a day when mankind will surgically and medically change people into 58 or more different gender mutations by mutilation? We have come to a place where live birth abortion is tolerated. Things they are a-changing. We go to the media, where the reporting of news has become the versioning of news. The news has changed from journalism to propagandism. My wife told me the last week, she said, I used to feel sorry for people in communist countries because all they got in the news stations was propaganda. She says, it's come to America. We've gone from the, new, the, the journalists telling the news people, from telling us what the news is, to telling us what they want it to be. And now we come to the church. Even among believers, there's a rush to change to capitulate to worldly norms which are in themselves in a state of never-ending flux. If the church is going to keep changing to accommodate society and the culture, then we're never going to stay anywhere because it's always changing. Solomon warns his son of the calamities resulting of being given to change in verse 22. Now don't get me wrong, Change sometimes can be for the better. When I trusted Christ as my Savior, there was a change for the better. And as I walk with the Lord and allow His Spirit to uh, transform me, there are changes to the better. However, with mankind's fallen nature, change is rarely for the better. Man's first attempt at change took place in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember that? What did it do? It ruined everything. Remember Satan's promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5? For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now the problem is that man already knew good, and his action would only bring about a knowledge of evil. I think we'd all agree it would have been better off never to have known what evil was. Because it has ruined the situation. Now, why did man desire to disobey God? Because he wanted to change. Adam was not content with God's created order. He was not content with his limitation. He wanted to be God himself. Didn't Satan say to him, ye shall be as gods? And man said, well, why can't I be God? I mean, I, that's a change. I'd like to change. I'd like to be God. He wanted to change, to transmute. He wanted to pervert the order of things for his own supposed gain. And mankind has been making changes ever since. Not changes for the better toward God, but changes for the worse, away from God. I think America right now is further away from God than it's ever been in my lifetime, if not in history. Man's ultimate desire is to free himself from God, being himself God. Now this word change in the English 
And Merriam-Webster says change means to alter and vary. It means to become something different. Change may be used for making such a difference in a thing that it becomes something else. The Cambridge Dictionary says to make or become different. Vocabulary.com says the noun change can refer to anything or state that is different from what it once was. Collins English Dictionary says if there is a change in something, it becomes different. In other words, when something changes, it ceases to be what it was. Man changed from being sinless to being sinners. Man changed from being innocent to being guilty. The world changed from being perfect to being cursed. Life changed to death. And man's relationship with God changed from fellowship to enmity. Why? Because man was given to change. He wanted to change. And in order to change, he had to go against God's word. And any change that goes against God's word is a bad place to be. I look around and I see things are changing. The world is changing, America is changing. The home is changing. Society is changing. Right and wrong are changing. Rules and norms are changing. Gender identification is changing. Christians are changing. And churches are changing. What does that mean? That means we're becoming something different than what we were. This phrase, given to change, infers a restlessness or discontent of spirit. A change of foundational and fundamental things for immediate results without careful consideration of long-term effects. Let's not worry what happens, let's just do it. We want to change. The ultimate end of change that is incautious, ill-formed, frequent and rapid is chaos and anarchy. It ends up in every man doing that which is right in his own eyes and that's a dangerous place. Now in these days of constant flux and change, there are some things that have not changed. There are some things that will not change. Things upon which you can depend. Things upon which you can count. Things that will bring stability, confidence, contentment, and tranquility to your heart and mind and life because they don't change. When people cannot count on something or someone not to change, then we live in a a, a state of uncertainty, don't we? We live in a state of unrest because we don't know if we can count on this and we don't know if that's going to change and we don't know where that's going to be tomorrow. And that's where our society is living in the 21st century. But praise God, there are some things that do not change, some things that you can count on and depend upon. And the first one we find in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And the first thing we're looking at tonight is this. A never changing God. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. I am the Lord, says God. I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God promises us He never changes. If God changed, then He would cease to be what He was. That's the very definition of change. If God changed, then that means He was never God because God, by definition, doesn't need to change. 
If God changed, it means he was not perfect. He was not complete in himself. Now, God has certain attributes, and one of his attributes is that he is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. But if God had to change, then that would mean he was not all-powerful. His attribute is omniscience. That means he knows everything, always has known everything, always will know everything. There was never a time or a period or a place that God didn't know everything. If God changed, then that perhaps means he had to learn something or discover something. That means he wouldn't be God. God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once. God doesn't have to go anywhere. God doesn't have to show up. God is. Period. God is everywhere at once. But if he changes, does that mean that perhaps he wasn't everywhere at once? And he, or maybe he was almost everywhere at once and he changed and became everywhere at once. Or maybe he changed and became less everywhere at once. You following me? Another attribute of God is immutability. And that simply means he doesn't change. Change would mean that he was in some way incomplete or in need of improvement or it might indicate that he made a mistake or needed to grow, and therefore it means he's not really God. Think about it. The Bible says that God is love. I'm glad he doesn't change. What if all of a sudden God became hate? The Bible says God is good. I'm glad he never changes. What if all of a sudden he became bad? The Bible says that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Aren't you glad he hasn't changed? Amen. The Bible says God is merciful, God is gracious, God is long-suffering. Aren't you glad he doesn't change? Aren't you glad that all of a sudden he just doesn't become merciless instead of merciful? And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Aren't you glad he doesn't change? In Malachi, God is speaking to Israel. And he charges them with specific violations of his law in verse 5. He says that they're guilty of sorcery, adultery, lying, extortion, oppression, and injustice. And then in verse 8, he says they're guilty of robbing God. And in verse 14, they're guilty of a complaining spirit and says that he would have utterly destroyed them. But he gave them a promise. And he never changes. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, therefore, because I don't change, you're not consumed. You're not utterly wiped off the face of the earth. Amen. What makes the sun come up every day? What makes the tide come in and out with regularity? What makes summer follow winter without fail? What makes it possible for you to set your watch by the sun? A never changing God. Amen. There's one thing you can count on in this world, and that is that God never changes. You have a never changing God. Boy, I'm thankful for that. Amen. The second thing we have is in Romans chapter 11, if you turn there with me. The second never changing thing I want to show you is in Romans chapter 11, and it is a never changing grace. Romans, someone said to me recently, boy, you, you, you talk a lot about grace, you preach a lot about grace. Oh, yes, I do. Because I'm so thankful for it. Romans chapter 11 verse 5 says this. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant. According to the election of grace. And if by grace then it is no more of works. Otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works then there is no more grace. Otherwise work is no more work. 
And here's the principle of God's dealing with mankind. Grace. Grace. You know what grace means? It means undeserved favor. It means everything we have, we don't deserve. You don't deserve to breathe. You don't deserve to live. You don't deserve to drink water. You don't deserve everything you have. It's by God's matchless grace. You know what you deserve? What does every human being born on planet Earth since Adam, except for Jesus Christ, what do they deserve? A hot spot in hell. Spot in hell. That's what you deserve. Everything else is God's grace. That doesn't fit with today's theme, does it? Oh, you deserve a break today. No, you don't. <laughs> but you can, ha- you can have one by grace. Israel, even to this day, has always had a remnant. Do you realize the world has tried to annihilate and eradicate and erase Israel off the face of the earth for centuries? And it's just a little tiny, itty bitty little country. But the great powers of the world could not destroy Israel. Why? God's grace. That's why. It's not because Israel deserves to exist or has earned the right to exist or is self-existent, but because of the grace of Almighty God. God had made a promise to Israel, and because He does not and cannot change, there's no power in heaven and no power on earth that can completely eradicate Israel. The principle of grace is that it never changes. If grace did change, then it would cease to be grace. What does change mean? It means to become something other than what it was, something different than what it was. So grace, if it changes, it's not grace anymore. That's what that verse is in Romans 11, 5 and 6 is trying to help us understand. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You look at Romans chapter 11, verse 16, and it says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. In other words, listen, if you're either saved by grace or you're saved by works, it can't be... It can't be works, and it can't be a combination of the two. Because when you try to combine works with grace, grace ceases to be grace. It becomes something different than what it was. What was it before? Undeserved favor. Once you add works to it, now there's the idea of desert. Grace is grace, and works is works, and it cannot be the other. You're either trusting in the grace of God or you're trusting in works. To trust in a combination of grace's works is erroneous because they cancel each other out. Believers have been saved by grace in both the Old and the New Testaments. It has never been otherwise. Believers will always be saved by grace, even during the tribulation period. Old Testament believers were saved by the grace of God by looking to the Messiah who would come. Believers in the New Testament are saved by grace by looking to the Messiah who has come. And those who will be saved during the tribulation period will also have to look to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all by grace. My dear friend, you have not done one single itty-bitty, teeny-weeny little thing to help with your salvation. Jesus paid it all. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. He rose from the dead. That's what it took. It didn't take some little puny effort on your part. It doesn't take some goodness on your part because the Bible says there's none good but God. It's by grace. The gospel of salvation never changes. However, religions change, don't they? Traditions change, 
and philosophies change. Why? Because they're from man. See, we have a never-changing God who has extended never-changing grace. But religions change and philosophies change and traditions change because they're not of God, they're of man. And what does man do? Man changes. Man is given to change. To preach a gospel of works is to pervert the gospel of grace. To change the truth of God into a lie. And to worship the creature more than the creator. Matter of fact, look over in Romans chapter 1. You're in Romans 11. Just look over at Romans chapter 1. As I read beginning at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. But that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them, unto, gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. A person gets saved today the same way they always got saved, by grace, through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Because God is merciful, he extended to us salvation by his grace by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ alone as Savior. Amen. Aren't you glad God never changes? Yes. Aren't you glad the gospel never changes? Yes. Aren't you glad that there is a ne uh, there's never some new way or some better way to get saved? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In an ever-changing world, there is a never-changing God and a never-changing grace. And my third point is found in Psalm 12. We have a never-changing God. We have a never-changing grace. And point number three, we have a never-changing good book. Amen. Psalm chapter 12, look at verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. By good book, I of course mean the Bible. It used to be called the good book. 
and God declares that the Word of God, the Bible, is pure and preserved. Supernaturally preserved by God. Listen, we need the Word of God in every generation of human history because if we don't have it, we don't got nothing. It's the only objective reality and truth. That means that the never-changing God has produced a never-changing book. And he's also promised to preserve his word unto every generation. The Bible is a singularly unique book. It is inspired of God. It is inerrant and infallible. It is breathed by God and penned by men. And the Bible is an eternal book of truth. Speaking to the disciples, the Lord Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. And truth never changes. You see, what does it mean to change? It means you have to become something different than it was. So if truth changes, it becomes untruth. It ceases to be what it was. Truth never changes. Two plus two is four. Is that true? Is it ever going to change? No. What happens if all the colleges start teaching that two plus two is three? Does that make it true? No. Truth doesn't change. The word of God is truth that never changes. If it does, then it becomes something other than it was. You see, truth doesn't change and truth doesn't evolve. It just is. When Moses asked God, whom shall I say sent me? You know what God said? Tell them I am hath sent me. Why did he say I am? Because he's a never changing God who always was. There was never a moment, there was never a time when God was not. He always existed, he exists and he always will exist, so he always is I am. He's not I was or I will be, I am. Truth never changes because truth comes from God. And God never changes. In Psalm 119, verse 89, the Bible says this, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So it does not matter what man does with God's word here on earth because it's forever settled in heaven where man can do, cannot do anything about it. Psalm 119, 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Matthew 24, verse 35. Jesus said this, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. 1 Peter 1, 25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And then in Revelation chapter 14 verse 6, John says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, unto every nation and kindred and tongue and people. You get the point? God's word never changes. God's word is settled. It's done. It's complete. End of sentence. And it will endure forever. There will never be a time when the word of God is not. God has promised to preserve his word to every generation without change. Why? Because if you change it, it's not what it was. You following me? You got the word of God. Now if you change it, 
It's no longer the Word of God because it was the Word of God. Now you've changed it into something different than it was. To change the Word of God means that it was not pure or perfect. To change the Word of God means it was lacking or needed improvement. How many times are we going to improve the Word of God? You know how many Bibles we have today that are an improvement on the improvement? We've got improvements on the improvements. Just as man is given to change, he's given to improvement. That's why God wrote in Revelation chapter 22 this. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Listen, human beings have no right to change the word of God. We have no power to change the word of God. You can change it here, but it don't change there. We can deceive ourselves and fool ourselves and pride ourselves of all our improvements on the word of God, but they are phony and fake because it's settled in heaven. I fear for those who have changed the word of God. I fear for those who have condensed and paraphrased and dumbed down the Word of God. I fear for those who have put religion and traditions and philosophy ahead of the Bible. I fear for those who add or subtract from the written Word of God as found in the Masoretic text and the Textus Receptus. God help us when we try to twist and tailor the Word of God to fit our fancies and justify our position. Aren't you glad that in an ever-changing world, we have a never-changing book? Amen. Aren't you glad that God in His omnipotence has preserved it for us? Amen. But see, if God changed, then we wouldn't have a never-changing book. Aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus, who is, according to John chapter 1, the living word, aren't you glad he does not change? You know why Jesus never changes? You know what it says in Hebrews 13, verse 8? It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know why Jesus never changes? Because Jesus is God. He's deity. The Christ who formed the worlds in Genesis Chapter 1 is the same Christ today. The Christ for whom the Hebrews looked is the same Christ of today. The Christ whom the apostles followed is the same Christ today. The Christ of today will be the same tomorrow. And the Christ of eternity past is the same throughout eternity future. I'm reminded of the hymn writer's words. All may change, but Jesus never. Amen. Glory to his name. In an ever-changing world of ever-changing men and ever-changing truth, according to men, we have a never-changing God, a never-changing grace, and a never-changing good book. Amen. Beware of those, however, However noble they may be, however noteworthy they may be, however nomenclatured they may be, beware of those who are given to change. It's in the Bible. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed just for a few minutes longer. I want to ask those of you who are here today and you are 
saved, you are born again, you're a child of God by grace through faith in Christ. I want to ask you, are you given to change? We need to be careful not to allow ourselves to get carried away with the trend of changing to fit the times or changing to fit the culture. The world still needs that which is unchanging and steadfast. We need to pray for the church now more than ever. We need to pray for America now more than ever. We need to pray for our families now more than ever. We need to pray for revival now more than ever. Let me ask you, Christian, have you changed? Or will you be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Are you willing to stand and having done all to stand? Or will you move away to change? Is it important to you what people think or what God thinks? Are you trying to please men or are you trying to please God? Don't change. Maybe you're here today and you've never been saved, never been born again. With God, nothing's changed. Not him, not his word, not his grace. 